Vladimir, Megre. Anastasia. The Ringing Cedar Series. Book 1. Translated from, The Russian, by John Woodsworth. Edited by Leonid Cherishkin. Ringing Cedars Press. Columbia, Missouri, USA. Chapter 1. The Ringing Cedar. Anastasia. The Ringing Cedar Series. Book 1. Chapter 1. Ringing Cedar. In the spring of 1994, I chartered three riverboats on which I carried out a three month expedition on the River Obi in Siberia. Dot from Novosibirsk to Sulakard and back. The aim of the expedition was to foster economic ties with the regions of the Russian Far North. The expedition went under the name of the Merchant Convoy. The largest of the three riverboats was a passenger ship, named the Patrice, Lumumba. Western Siberian riverboats bear rather interesting names, the Maria Ulyanova, the Patrice Lumumba, the Mikhail Kalinin. Point one as if there were no other, personages in history worth commemorating. The lead ship Patrice Lumumba. How's the expedition headquarters, along with a store, where local Siberian entrepreneurs could exhibit their wares. The plan was for the convoy to travel north. 3,500 kilometers, to visiting not only Mayor ports of call such as Tomsk, Nizhnyavardovsk, Kandimansisk and Sulakard, but smaller places as well. Where goods could be unloaded. Only during a brief summer navigation season. The convoy would dock at a populated settlement during the daytime. We would offer the wares we had brought for sale, and hold talks, about setting up, regular economic links. Our traveling was Maria Ulyanova, a name, born by two historical figures, Maria Alexandrovna Ulyanova, née Blank, 1835-1916, colon mother to Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, A. K. A. Vladimir Lenin, founder of the Soviet Union, and Maria Alinikna Ulyanova, 1878 to 1937, Lenin's sister. The ship has since been renamed the Victor Gashkov. Patrice Emery Lumumba, 1925 to 1961, communist leader of the Mouvement National Congolais, who formed the first elected government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The ship is now known as the Paris. Mikhail Ivanovich Kalinin, 1875-1946, as Chairman of the Soviet National Executive Committee, the USSR's first titular head of state, the Kalinin still retains its original name. 3,500 kilometers. The metric system of measures is used throughout the book. One kilometer equals approximately six tenths, 0 0.6, of a mile, usually done at night. If weather conditions were unfavorable for Navigation, the lead ship would put into the nearest port, and we would organize onboard parties for the local young people. Most places offered little in the way of their own entertainment, clubs and community centers. So-called houses of culture had been going downhill ever since the collapse of the USSR, and there were almost no cultural activities available. Sometimes we might go for 24 hours, or more without seeing a single populated place, even the tiniest village. From the river, the only transportation artery. For many kilometers around. The only thing visible to the eye was the taiga itself. I was not yet aware at the time that. Somewhere amidst the uninhabited. Vastness of forest along the riverbank. A surprise meeting was awaiting me, one that was to change my whole life. One day on our way back to Novosibirsk, I arranged to dock the lead ship at a small village, one with only a few houses at best, some 30 or 40 kilometers distant from the larger population centers. I planned a three-hour stopover, so the crew could have shore leave, and the local residents 
could buy some of our goods, and foodstuffs, and we could cheaply pick up from them fish, and wild growing plants of the taiga. During our stopover time, as the leader of the expedition I was approached, by two of the local senior citizens, as I judged at the time. One of them appeared to be somewhat older than the other. The elder of the two, a wizened fellow with a long gray beard, kept silent the whole time, leaving his younger companion to do the talking. This fellow tried to persuade me to lend him fifty of my crew, which numbered no more than sixty-five in total, to go with them into the taiga, about twenty-five kilometers or so from the dock, where the ship was berthed. They would be taken into the depths of the taiga to cut down a tree, he described as a ringing cedar. The cedar, which he said reached forty meters in height, needed to be cut up into pieces, which could be carried by hand to the ship. We must, he said, definitely take the whole lot. The old fellow further recommended, that each piece be cut up into smaller pieces. Each of us should keep one for himself, and give the rest to relatives, friends and anyone who wished to accept a piece as a gift. He said this was a most unusual cedar. The piece should be worn, on one's chest as a pendant. Hang it around your neck, while standing barefoot in the grass, and then press it to your chest, with the palm of your left hand. It takes only a moment to feel the, pleasing warmth emanating from the piece, of cedar, followed by a light tingling sensation running through the whole body. From time to time, whenever desired, the side of the pendant facing away from the, body should be rubbed with one's fingers, the thumbs, pressed against the other side. The old fellow confidently assured me that, within three months the possessor, of one of these ringing cedar pendants, will feel significant improvement in his sense of well-being, and will be cured of many diseases. Even AIDS? I asked, and briefly explained, what I had learned about this disease from the press. The oldster confidently replied, from any and all diseases. But this, he considered, was an easy task. The main benefit, was that anyone having one of these pendants would become kinder more successful and more talented. I did know a little about the healing properties, of the cedars of our Siberian taiga, but the suggestion, that it could affect one's feelings. And abilities? Well, that to me seemed beyond the bounds of probability. The thought came to me that maybe these old men wanted money from me for this unusual cedar, as they themselves called it. And I began explaining that out in the big wide world, women were used to wearing jewelry, made of gold and silver, and wouldn't pay a dime for some scrap of wood, and so I wasn't going to lay out any money for anything like that. They don't know what they're wearing came the reply. Gold. Well, that's dust, in comparison with one piece of this cedar, but we don't need any money for it. We can give you some dried mushrooms. In addition, but there's nothing we need from you. Not wanting to start an argument, out of respect for their age. I said. Well, maybe someone will wear some of your cedar pendants. They certainly would, if a top wood carving craftsman agreed to put his hand to it, and create something of amazing beauty. To which the old fellow replied. Yes, you could carve it, but it would be better to polish it. By rubbing. It will be a lot better, if you do this yourself, with your fingers. Whenever your heart desires, then the cedar will also have a beautiful look to it. Then the younger of the two, quickly unbuttoned first his old worn jacket, and then his shirt, and revealed what he was wearing on his chest. I looked, and saw a puffed, out circle or oval. It was multi colored, purple, raspberry, auburn, forming some kind of puzzling design, the vein lines, on the wood looked like little streams. I am not, a connoisseur objet d'art, although from time to time, I have had occasion to visit picture galleries. The world's great masters had not called forth any particular emotions in me, but the object hanging around this man's neck aroused significantly greater feelings and emotions than any of my visits to the Trechikov gallery. How many years have you been rubbing this piece of cedar? I asked. Ninety-three, the old fellow responded. 
And how old are you? 119. At the time, I didn't believe him. He looked like a man of 75. Either, he hadn't noticed my doubts or, if he had, he paid no attention to them. In somewhat excited tones, he started in trying to persuade me. That any piece of this cedar, polished by human fingers alone, would also look beautiful in just three years. Then it would start looking even better and better, especially when worn by a woman. The body of its wearer would give off a pleasant and beneficial aroma, quite unlike anything artificially produced by man. Indeed, a very pleasant fragrance was emanating from both these old men. I could feel it, even though I'm a smoker, and, like all smokers, have a dulled sense of smell. And there was one other peculiarity. I suddenly became aware of phrases, in the speech of these strangers, that were not common, to the residents of this isolated part of the North. Some of them I remember to this day, even the intonations associated with them. Here is what the old fellow told me. God created the cedar to store cosmic energy. When someone is in a state of love, they emit a radiant energy. It takes but a second, for it to reflect, off the celestial bodies floating overhead, and come back to earth, and give life to everything that breathes. The sun is one of those celestial bodies, and it reflects but a tiny fraction of such radiance. Only bright rays, can travel into space from man on the earth. And only beneficial rays, can be reflected from space, back to earth. Under, the influence of malicious feelings. Man can emit only dark rays. These dark rays cannot rise, but must fall into the depths of the earth, bouncing off its core, they return to the surface in the form of volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, wars etc. The culminating achievement, of these dark rays is their direct effect on the man, originating them, invariably exacerbating this man's own malicious feelings. Cedars live to be, 550 years old, day and night. Their millions of needles, catch and store the whole spectrum of bright energy. During the period, of the cedar's life, all the celestial bodies pass above them, reflecting this bright energy. Even in one tiny piece of cedar, there is more energy beneficial to man, than in all the man-made energy installations taken together. Cedars, receive the energy emanating from man, through space. Store it up, and at the right moment, give it back. They give it back. When there is not enough of it in space. In other words, in man. Or in everything living, and growing on the earth. Occasionally, though very rarely one discovers cedars, that have been storing up energy, but not giving back, what they have stored. After, 500 years of their life, they start to ring, this is how. They talk to us, through their quiet ringing sound, this is how they signal people, to take them, and saw them up, to make use of their stored up energy on the earth, this is what the cedars are asking with their ringing sound. They, keep on asking for three whole years. If they don't have contact, with living human beings, then in three years, deprived of the opportunity, to give back what they have received, and stored from space, they lose their ability to give it back, directly to man, then they will start, burning up the energy internally. This torturous process, of burning, and dying, lasts 27 years. Not long ago, we discovered a cedar like this. We determined, that it had been ringing, for two years already. It was ringing very softly. Perhaps, it is trying to draw out its request. Over a longer period of time, 
but still, it has. Only one year left, it must be sought up, and given away to people. The old man spoke at length, and for some reason, I heard him out. The voice of this strange old Sibiriak sounded at first, quietly confident, then very excited, and when he got excited, he would rub the piece of cedar with his fingertips as though they were lightly tripping over some kind of musical instrument. It was cold on the river bank. An autumn wind was blowing across the river. Gusts of wind ruffled the hair on the old men's capless heads, but the spokesman's jacket and shirt remained unbuttoned. His fingertips kept rubbing the cedar pendant on his chest, still exposed to the wind. He was still trying to explain its significance to me. Lydia Petrovna, an employee of my firm, came down the gangplank to tell me that everyone else was already on board and waiting for me to finish my conversation. I bade farewell to the oldsters and quickly climbed aboard. I couldn't act on their request for two reasons, delaying departure especially for three days, would mean a significant financial loss. And besides, everything these old fellows said, seemed to me, at the time, to be in the realm of pure superstition. The next morning, during our usual company meeting, I suddenly noticed that Lydia Petrovna was fingering a cedar pendant of her own. Later she would tell me, that after I'd gone aboard, she stayed behind for a while. She noticed that when I started hurrying away from them, the oldster that had been talking with me stared after me with a perplexed look and then said excitedly to his older companion. Now how can that be? Why didn't they get it? I really don't know how to speak their language. I couldn't, make them believe, I simply, couldn't. Why? Tell me, father. The elder man, put his hand on his son's shoulder and replied. You weren't convincing enough, son. They didn't grasp it. As I was going up the gangplank, Lydia Petrovna went on. The old man that was, talking with you, suddenly rushed up to me grabbed me by the arm and led me back down to the grass below. He hurriedly pulled out of his pocket a string, and attached to it, was this piece of cedar wood. He put it around my neck, and pressed it against my chest, with the palm of both his hand and mine. I even felt a shiver, go through my whole body. Somehow he managed to do, all this very quickly, and I didn't even get a chance, to say anything. To him. As I was walking away, he called after me, have a safe journey. Be happy. Please come again next year. All the best, people. Well be. Waiting for you. Have a safe journey. As the ship, pulled away from the dock, the old fellow kept on waving, at us for a long time, and then, all at once sat down on the grass. I was watching him, through a pair of binoculars. The old man that talked with you, and later gave me the pendant. I saw him sit down, on the grass, and his shoulders were trembling. The older one, with the long beard, was bending over him, and stroking his head. Amidst, the flurry of my subsequent commercial dealings, account keeping, and end-of-voyage farewell banquets. I completely forgot about the strange Siberian oldsters. Upon my return to Novosibirsk, I was afflicted with sharp pains. The diagnosis, a duodenal intestinal ulcer, and osteochondrosis of the thoracic spine. In the quiet of the comfy hospital ward, I was cut off 
from the bustle of everyday life, my deluxe private room, gave me an opportunity to calmly reflect, on my four-month expedition, and to draw up a business plan for the future. But, it seemed as though, my memory relegated just about everything, that had happened to the background. And for some reason, the old men, and what they said, came to the fore. Front of my thought. I requested, to have delivered to me, in the hospital, all sorts of literature. On cedars. After comparing, what I read, with what I had heard. I became more, and more amazed, and began to actually believe, what? The oldsters had said. There was at least, some kind of truth in there. Words. Or, maybe the whole thing was true? In books, on folk medicine, there is a lot said, about the cedar as a healing remedy. They say, that everything, from the tips of the needles to the bark, is endowed, with highly, effective healing properties. The Siberian cedar wood, has a beautiful appearance, and artistic wood. Carving, masters enjoy great success, in using it for furniture, as well as soundboards, for musical instruments. Cedar needles, are highly capable, of decontaminating the surrounding air. Cedar wood has a distinctive, pleasant balsam fragrance. A small cedar chip, placed inside a house, will keep moths away. In the popular science literature, I read, it was said, that the qualitative characteristics, for the northern cedars, were, significantly higher than for those growing in the south. Back in 1792, the academician P. S. Pallas, wrote that the fruits of the Siberian cedar, were effective in restoring youth, and virility, and significantly, increasing the body's ability, to withstand a number of diseases. There is a whole host, of historical phenomena directly, or indirectly, linked, to the Siberian cedar. Here is one of them. In 1907, a fifty-year-old semi-literate peasant, named Gregory Rasputin, who hailed from an isolated Siberian village, in an area where the Siberian cedar grows, found himself in St. Petersburg, the capital, and soon became a regular guest of the imperial family. Not only did he amaze them with his predictions, but he possessed incredible sexual stamina. At the time of his assassination, onlookers were struck by the fact that despite his bullet-ridden body, he continued to live. Perhaps because he had been raised on cedar nuts, in a part of the country where cedars abound. This is how a contemporary journalist described his staying power. At age 50, he could begin an orgy at noon and go on carousing until 4 o'clock in the morning. From his fornication and drunkenness he would go directly to the church for morning prayers and stand praying until 8 before heading home for a cup of tea, then, as if nothing had happened, he would carry on receiving visitors, until two in the afternoon. Next, he would collect a group of ladies, and accompany them to the baths. From the baths, he would be off to a restaurant in the country, where, he would begin repeating, the previous night's activities. No normal person, could ever, keep up a regime like that. The many-time world champion, and Olympic champion wrestler Alexander Karelin, who has never been defeated so far, is also a Siberian, also from an area where the Siberian cedar grows. This strong man also eats cedar nuts. A. Coincidence? I mention only those facts, which can be easily verified in popular science. Literature, or which can be confirmed by witnesses. Lydia Petrovna, who was given the ringing cedar pendant by the Siberian oldster, is now one of those witnesses. She is 36 years old, married with two children. Her co-workers have noticed changes in her behavior. She has become kinder and smiles. More often, her husband, whom I happen to know, told me that their family has now been experiencing a greater degree of mutual understanding. He also remarked that his wife, has somehow become younger looking, and is starting to arouse greater feelings in him, more respect, and, quite possibly, more love. But, all these multitudinous facts, and evidences, 
pale in comparison to the main point, which you can look up for yourself, a discovery which has left me with not a trace of doubt, and that is the Bible. In the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, ch. 14, verses 4, God teaches us how to treat people, and even decontaminate their houses, with the help of the cedar. After, comparing all the facts, and data I had gleaned from various sources, I was confronted by such a remarkable picture, that all the miracles, known to the world faded before it. The great mysteries, that have excited people's minds, began to pale into insignificance, in comparison with the mystery of the ringing cedar. Now, I could no longer, have any doubts about its existence. They were all dis. Spelled, by the popular science literature, and the old Vedic scriptures. I was. Reading. Cedars, are mentioned 42 times in the Bible, all in the Old. Testament. When Moses, presented humanity with the Ten Commandments. On stone tablets, he probably knew more than has been recorded in the Old. Testament. We are accustomed, to the fact that in nature, there are various plants capable of treating human ills. The healing properties of the cedar, have been attested in popular science literature, by such serious and authoritative researchers, as Academician Palace, and this is consistent with the Old Testament scriptures. And now, pay careful attention. When the Old Testament, talks about the cedar, it is just the say dar alone. Nothing is said about other trees. And doesn't the Old Testament say, that the cedar is the most potent medicine, of any existing in nature? What is this, anyway? A medicine kit? And how is it to be used? And why, out of all the Siberian cedars, did these strange old fellows point to a single ringing cedar? But, that's not all. Something immeasurably more mysterious lies, behind this story from the Old Testament. King Solomon, built a temple out of cedar wood. In return for the cedar from Lebanon, he gave another king, Hiram, twenty cities of his kingdom. Incredible. Giving away twenty cities just for some kind of building. Materials? True, he got something else in return. At King Solomon's request. He was given servants that were skilled in felling timber. What kind of people were these? What knowledge did they possess? I have heard that even now, in the far-flung reaches of the taiga, there are old people whose job, it is to choose trees for construction. But back then, over two thousand years ago, everybody might have known this. Nevertheless, specialists of some sort were required. The temple was built, services began to be held there, and the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. What kind of a cloud was that? How and from where did it enter the temple? What could it have been? Energy? A spirit? What kind? Of phenomenon, and what connection did it have with the cedar? The old fellows, talked about the ringing cedar, as storing up some kind of energy. Which cedars are stronger, the ones in Lebanon or Siberia? Academician Palace said, that the healing properties of the cedars, increased in proportion to their proximity to the forest tundra. In that case, then, the Siberian cedar would be the stronger. It says in the Bible, by their fruits ye shall know them. In other words, again, the Siberian cedar. Could it be that no one has paid any attention to all this? Has no one put two and two together? The Old Testament, the science of the past century, and the current one, are all of the same opinion, regarding the cedar. And Elena Ivanovna Rurik, notes in her book, Living Ethics, a chalice of cedar resin, figured in the rituals of the consecration, of the kings of the ancient Khorasan. Druids also called, the chalice of cedar resin the chalice of life. And only later, with the loss of the realization of the spirit, was it replaced by blood. The fire of Zoroaster, was the result, of burning of the cedar resin in the chalice. So, 
Then, how much of our forebear's knowledge of the cedar, its properties, and uses has been passed down to the present day? Is it possible that nothing has been preserved? What did the Siberian oldsters know about it? And all at once, my memory harked back, to an experience of many years ago. Which caused a shiver to run up and down my spine. I didn't pay any attention. To it back then, but now. During, the early years of perestroika, I was president of the Association of Siberian Entrepreneurs. One day, I got a call from, the Novosibirsk District. Executive Council, back then we still had Communist Party committees and Executive Councils, asking me to come to a meeting with a prominent Western businessman. He, had a letter of recommendation from the government, of the day. Several entrepreneurs were present, along with workers from the Executive Council Secretariat. The Western businessman, was of a rather imposing external appearance, an unusual person with oriental features. He was wearing a turban, and his fingers were adorned with precious rings. The discussion, as usual, centered around the possibilities, for cooperation in various fields. The visitor said, among other things, we would like to buy cedar nuts from you. As he spoke these words, his face and body tightened, and his sharp eyes moved from side to side, no doubt studying the reaction of the entrepreneurs present. I remember the incident very well, as even then, I wondered why his appearance had changed like that. After, the official meeting, the Moscow interpreter accompanying him came up to me. She said he would like to speak with me. The businessman made me a confidential proposal. If I could arrange delivery of cedar nuts for him, and they had to be fresh, then I would receive a handsome, personal percentage over and above. The official price. The nuts were to be shipped, to Turkey for processing into some kind of oil. I said, I would think it over. I decided, I would find out for myself what kind, of oil he was talking about. And. I did. On the London market, which sets the standard for world prices, cedar nut oil. Fetches anywhere, up to $500 per kilogram. Their proposed deal, would have given us, approximately $2 to $3. For one kilogram of cedar nuts. I rang up an entrepreneur, I happened to know in Warsaw, and asked him whether, it might be possible, to market such a product, directly to the consumer, and whether, we could learn the technology involved in its extraction. A month later, he sent me a reply, no way we weren't able to gain access to the technology, and besides, there are certain Western powers, so involved, in these issues of yours, that it would be better just to forget about it. After that, I turned to my good friend, Konstantin Rakhanov, a scholar with our Novosibirsk Consumer Cooperative Institute. I bought a shipment of nuts, and financed a study. And the laboratories, of his institute, produced approximately, 100 kilograms of cedar nut oil. I also hired researchers, who came up with the following information, from archival documents. Before the revolution, and even for some time afterward, there was in Siberia an organization, known as the Siberian Cooperator. People from this organization, traded in oil, including cedar nut oil. They had rather, swanky branch offices in Harbin, London and New York and rather large Western bank accounts. After the revolution, the organization eventually collapsed, and many of its members went abroad. A member, of the Bolshevist government, Leonid Krasin, met with the head of this organization, and asked him to return to Russia. But, the head of the Siberian cooperator, replied that he would be of more help to Russia, if he remained outside its borders. From, archival materials, I further learnt, that cedar oil was made. Using wooden, only wooden, presses in many villages of the Siberian. Taiga. The quality of the cedar oil, depended on the season in, which. The nuts were gathered, and how they were processed. But I was unable. To determine, either from the archives or the institute, exactly, which. Season was being indicated. 
the secret had been lost, there, are no healing remedies, with properties analogous to those of cedar. Oil. But, perhaps the secret of making this oil, had been passed along. By one of the emigres, to someone in the west? How is it possible? That the cedar nuts, with the most effective healing properties, grow in Siberia, and yet, the facility for producing the oil, is located in Turkey? After all, Turkey, has no cedars like those found in Siberia. And just what Western powers, was the Warsaw entrepreneur talking about? Why did he say it would be better just to forget about this issue? Might not these powers, be smuggling this product, with its extraordinary healing properties, out of our Russian Siberian taiga? Why, with such a treasure here at home, with such effective properties, a treasure known for centuries, for millennia, even, do we spend millions, and maybe billions of dollars, buying up foreign medicines, and swallow them up, like half-crazed people? How is it that we have lost the knowledge known to our forebears? Our recent forebears yet, ones who lived in our century. And, what about the Bible's description, of that extraordinary happening? Of over 2,000 years ago? What kind of unknown powers, are trying so earnestly, to erase our forebears' knowledge, from our own memories? Oh, you'd better stick to minding your own business. We're told. Yes, they are trying to wipe it out. And, indeed, they are. Succeeding. I was seized by a fit of anger. I checked, and yes, cedar oil is sold in our pharmacies, but it is sold in foreign packaging. I bought a single 30 gram vial and tried it. The actual oil content, I think, was no more than a couple of drops, the rest was some kind of diluting agent. Compared, to what was produced in the Consumer Cooperative Institute, well, there was simply no comparison. And, these diluted couple of drops, cost 50,000 rubles. So, what if we didn't buy it abroad? But sold it ourselves? Just the sale of this oil would be enough, to raise the whole of Siberia, above the poverty level. But, how did we ever manage to let go of the technology of our forebears? And here we are sniveling, that we live like paupers. Well, okay I think I'll come up with something all the same. I'll produce the oil myself. And my firm will only get wealthier. I decided, I would try a second expedition along the OB. Back up north. Using only my headquarters. Ship, the Patrice Lumumba. Loaded a variety of goods. For sale into the hold. And turned the film. Viewing room into a store. I decided to hire a new crew. And not invite anyone from my firm. As things stood, my firm's financial situation had worsened while I was distracted with my new interest. Two weeks after leaving Novosibirsk, my security guards reported they had overheard conversations about the ringing cedar. And, in their opinion, the newly hired workers included some pretty strange people. To put it mildly, I began summoning individual crew members to my quarters to talk about the forthcoming trek into the taiga, some of them even agreed to go on a volunteer basis. Others asked for extra pay, for this operation, since it was not something they had agreed to, when signing up for work. It was one thing, to stay in the comfortable conditions aboard ship, quite another to trek 25 kilometers into the taiga, and back, carrying loads of wood, my finances, at the time were, already pretty tight. I had not planned on selling the cedar. After all, the oldsters had said it should be given away. Besides, my main interest was not, the cedar tree itself, but the secret of how to extract the oil. And of course, it would be fascinating, to find out all the details, connected with it. Little by little, with the help of my security guards, I realized that there would be attempts, made to spy on my movements, especially, after I left the ship. But for what purpose was unclear. And who was behind the would-be spies? I thought and thought about it and decided that to be absolutely certain, I would somehow, have to outsmart everyone at once. 